أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المظلمين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذرهم يأكلوا ويتمتعوا ويلههم الأمل فسوف يعلمون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala There is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he gives us these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of him, Tabaraka wa ta'ala. Then we send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Imam al-Hujjah, Jalallahu ta'ala, Farajahu sharif Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the istishhad anniversary of the sons of Hazrat Muslim, Muhammad and Ibrahim, Alayhim wa ala nabiyyina wa alihi yafdalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When we look at the life of these two young boys, what we would call, you know, in reflection, we can only pray and hope that we are leading a life in which we can demonstrate as much loyalty to our imam as these two young boys demonstrated to the imam of their time. You know, the, that's the constant struggle that we have, isn't it? To, to stay focused. To stay focused on the target that has been set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not an unknown to us what that target is. The target is to earn the pleasure of God. To work hard, to refrain from things which He has forbidden. And inshallah receive that ultimate reward of Rida Allah wal Jannah. And the closeness to God, the pleasure of God and Jannah. But that in it, that's where the struggle lies, isn't it, right? I think, you know, all of us, I've been in this mode of reflection for the last couple of days because one of the most difficult things that I'm finding for my own spiritual growth, for example, is that to not let the outside noise distract you from the ultimate goal. And outside noise meaning... Uh, different stresses that may occur in one's life, different disappointments that may happen in one's life, uh, different challenges that we may face. And you know, it's all of us yeah, at any given time are undergoing certain challenges, certain stresses, things that disappoint us, things that upset us. But in that whole journey, you know, uh, what's becoming more and more clear to me is that we have to stay focused on that ultimate goal. And that is the remembrance of God, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and working towards that final, dest final destination. But that's the hard part, right? If it was that easy, we'd do it all the time, right? But it's to remind yourself amongst that noise, right? Amongst that chaos that, hey, stay focused. Don't get distracted. Because that noise just takes us away down another path that we don't want to go down. The, the thoughts that develop in one's mind and in one's head. And it's to stay focused. And, you know, this thought came to my mind today only. I was... I was getting ready to go, to come to mosque or to the meeting I was at before mosque and I was putting on my, let's just say socks and you know like we've always been told put your right leg first and your left leg second 
And then put your, if you're putting your pants on, put your right leg. When you're stepping out the house, step out with the right leg. Going into the bathroom, step into with the left leg. But this thought crossed my mind when I was putting on my clothes. Oh, put on your right. As I was about to put on my left, I said, oh, put on your right. And then I thought about that. Eh? Like, what difference would it make? Honestly, right? It's, what, can you tell me that from the realm of physicality, putting on your right leg first has great scientific benefit for you over your left leg? Nobody would be able to say that. But the only reason we do it, why? is because we've been told to do it. And when we are told to do it, the idea of doing these things, that inshallah in the realm of malakut, in the realm of spirituality, in the realm of metaphysics, sure, it may have a tremendous benefit that I don't know about, that you don't know about. But in the physical realm, it could hardly have any difference, right? Walking out with the right leg, walking with the left leg, whatever it is, right? But we do it, why? Because God has asked us to do it. And when I do it that way, what happens is that now I am more frequently and more often thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's an amazing thing. You know, it clicked on me today that why do we do these things? Why do I stress myself out? Baba, right leg first. You know, stressing my out for no reason, right? That, oh, you're drinking, stand up. You're drinking, now sit down. Oh, you're doing this, do this, do this, do this. But what's the purpose? I may, I'm not concerned about the thawab aspect. Inshallah, there would be a thawab that's associated because we've been asked to do it. But it becomes more and more apparent now, right? That the reason we're asked to do all of these things is that then constantly we are thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is that in every aspect of our life, we need to be God conscious. We need to be a muttaqi. And these are little things that help us along the way. And this is something that is really important, that we can't get distracted with these other things. And this is what we've been talking about, the idea of tulul amal. And we're going to, this is the fourth part of this lecture. And if God gives us enough life on Thursday, we will finish the series of tulul amal. What we've talked about so far with Tulul Amal, Tulul Amal means false expectations. Um, expectations, we have said, are a necessity. It is expectations that give us motivation to conduct any action. However, false expectations actually divert us and take us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we go from expectations to false expectations? Driving towards an expectant, uh, something that I am expecting, Versus all of a sudden I'm diverted to a path, now I'm going towards something which is false expectations, right? And this happens very subtly. We gave numerous examples last time, right? But one that really sticks out is, for example, um, I do something, I recite dua very well, right? Um, I, I help somebody out, I help a lady cross the road, I, I do something nice for somebody while driving, and all of a sudden I get credit for it, right? And that credit makes me feel good. Right? I feel acknowledged, I feel appreciated. And now my intention, instead of doing good for the sake of God, is to be appreciated. It's so easy. Yeah? It's so easy for it to happen, especially like when we're young, for example. Uh, but I'm not to say it doesn't happen to those who are old. It happens all the time. But for those who are young, they have to be very cautious. right? Because when we recite dua, then people say, MashaAllah, beta, you did a very good job. So next time I have extra ah uh, in my dua. You know, extra this in my dua. And it happens to all of us, right? The last time I opened the door, I got a thank you. Now let me open doors for people. They'll say thank you to me. It's now I've gone away from that expectation that God has of being a good human being versus that false expectation of getting praise for what I am doing and making me feel good. And so the trick that happens, right? What we would call the great trick. The great trick that actually happens is that in the usage of worldly um, gifts given to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the purpose of seeking His satisfaction and pleasure, the worldly gifts now become my ultimate goal in life. Attaining the worldly gift. So attaining that status, attaining that pleasure, attaining that satisfaction. Rather than looking forward to the results in the hereafter, I go after the results that I can attain in this world. Right? And that's where the great trick happens, where sometimes if I am not cognizant of this, if I am not aware of this, it's so easy for me to go down a road that I was not intending to go down, and it's only when it's really too late that I would notice. The question where we left off last time is, why does this happen? Right? Why do I get tricked? Why do I fall for this trick when we know it's a trick? 
right? Um, and our ulama, they say that the primary reason why we fall victim to false expectations is ignorance, jahl. Okay? It's ignorance on tremendous amount of levels. It's not that I'm not book smart, right? It's not that I didn't pass high school, that I'm not smart and I'm ignorant. No, we're talking about ignorance of a whole nother level, right? We're talking about, for example, I am ignorant of my own weakness, right? Where I think, for example, no, I'm going to chase that promotion and that promotion is going to get me happy, but I'm too strong to be tempted by this world. I know better and I will succeed. I don't realize I'm ignorant to my own nafs and my own nafs's temptations and my own nafs's weaknesses. There's a story in the Quran, I don't remember the verse and the surah right now, but we've talked about it a few years back. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a man who comes to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi. And he says, Ya Rasul Allah, pray to Allah that he makes me wealthy. Yeah. Now, you know, if we had that direct outlet, I think many of us would use that outlet, right? Right now we make dua, but if I go to the source directly, bihi ruzik al wara, we are told of our 12th Imam. By him, the, the creation is provided sustenance. Therefore, when I go to him, I can get sustenance, right? That's the reality. But the Prophet says to him, he says, look, man, he didn't say that, right? But he said, look, where you are is where God wants you to be. Don't ask for something other than that. But the man insisted, and he insisted until the Prophet prayed. Yeah? He gave him numerous chances not to have this dua, but the Prophet prayed for him. And the man became one of the wealthiest farmers in Medina. Right? He had uh, plantations and animals and this and that. And then when it came time for zakat, the Prophet sent someone and said, go collect zakat from this man. And when he went to that man, the man gave the weakest and most feeble sheep as zakat, when he had many healthy animals to give as zakat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a series of verses about this man in the Holy Quran, telling us, right, that recognize that you are weak. Don't ever think that, oh, I'm going to be immune from this. I'm not going to fall prey. And the reason why we go towards false expectations is because I am ignorant of my own weakness. Right? Rahimallahu imra'a ya'rif qadrahu, we are told. That blessed is the individual who knows his own self-worth. And doesn't think that they are above temptation. So that's ignorant on one level, our ulama say. On another level, they say, we are ignorant of the power of this world and the power of shaitan. This world has tremendous power to deceive us, right? Shaitan has tremendous power to trick us, right? And when we are not cognizant of that or on guard all the time, we would fall prey to these things. We have to be vigilant at every single moment. You know how tiring that can be? Right? This is why dunya is not supposed to be easy, right? But if we want to be successful, it's like I have to be my own security guard 24 hours a day, 365 days a week. I can't take a day off, right? I can't take a day off because if I knew the dangers of that which is lying around me, why would we take a day off, right? If you think about that in a material perspective, if, for example, it's cold season or flu season, I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to wash my hands more often. I'm going to start taking vitamin C. I'm going to start taking honey. I'm going to do all of these things and be extremely vigilant. When we let our guard down with shaitan, it's just a level of ignorance I'm demonstrating. I may not be saying it that, Ya Allah, I'm ignorant, but my hal, my condition, is demonstrating ignorance to the power of shaitan. Our second Imam Al Mujtaba alayhi salam. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You know, he says, I'm surprised that an individual who will take extra precaution at the food that they eat, but will not take extra precaution for the food of their soul. Yeah? You know, like I'm a check, a halal chin, where is the certificate? Yeah? Who's the butcher? Where did, oh, I'll do all of these things. But when it comes to my soul, there's not that level of vigilance that exists, right? And that points to a certain level of ignorance that lies in my head. Uh, uh, um, where I haven't reached that stage of rushed understanding or intellectual maturity, right? Another example of ignorance that our ulama say is, some may be ignorant to the power 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we mean by that is, yeah, He will punish me, but maybe it won't be that bad. Yeah? Maybe Allah is Rahim, Allah is Ghafoor, so I'm ignorant. When God says, man, I'm going to punish you, I'd be like, maybe He won't. Imagine how silly that is, right? Like, think about it. It makes, you, it makes one laugh, right? Like, I'll speed, maybe I won't get a ticket. No, of course, I'm not going to speed, right? But why do we do that when it comes to Allah? It points to a certain level of ignorance. There is ignorance, for example, where I'm not confident or I'm ignorant of, my next, of the next life that lies ahead of me, right? Where I don't, I mean, I believe in it. I think all of us here believe in, 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 in death, right? We believe in the hereafter. I don't think, I know we all believe, right? But our actions don't show that level of belief, Right? Where I will still sin, but I'm like, ha ha, al jannah to haq wa naru haq. Now, why are we sinning if jannah is haq and naru is haq? Right? It shows again, we go back to the fact this is so important. This is why our ulama say jahl. It points to ignorance. I am ignorant, for example, that I could die at any moment. Seriously, right? If we knew something was going to happen at any time, imminent, you look, for example, at what happened with Arma in Florida, right? They were given three, four days. What did the people do? They evacuated. Yeah? They prepared, they planned, they stored, they supplied, they went to get gas, and many who had to evacuate, evacuated. That's called planning, right? If there is an imminent danger of dying at any moment, you think that there would be some planning, right? So all of these examples, you know, it points to a level of ignorance that exists within human beings where I don't fully believe. And it points to the fact that I don't fully believe. Because if we were not ignorant to these things, then I would be preparing more for my next life. I would not be distracted. If I, if I was not ignorant to these things, right? Um, and I use I because where I don't think any of us have reached, I haven't reached the stage of Kamal to say that, mashallah, I am immune to these things, you know, but we're struggling to get there. But if I wasn't, for example, ignorant to these things, or if I wasn't ignorant to these things, then I would never be distracted from that ultimate goal of reaching the hereafter. Never would I be. That means everything I would do would be to reach that ultimate goal. Everything, right? Now, for some, for example, um, the ultimate goal would be not to get adab in Jahannam. For others, the ultimate goal would be uh, to earn the thawab in Jannah. Or for some, the ultimate goal would be to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's just a gradation system. There is one that's higher than the other, but all are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I was not ignorant, then whichever one of these three I fall into, that's what I'd be doing every time. Right? If I was afraid of punishment, then my entire life would be based on not getting punishment. It would be. Right? If I was wanting more daraja in Jannah, for example, my entire life would be based on that. If I was earning the pleasure of God, my entire motivation would be for that. You know, for example, if you want to buy your child a gift for Eid, you love your child, you want to get your child uh, happy with you, you buy them a nice gift and then you wrap it. Right? What's the point of wrapping? Because the child likes to open the wrapper. Right? The same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If I want to earn the pleasure of God, not only do I do good, I wrap my good gift for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? I do more than what is expected in other words. That means I'm constantly working towards that goal. And if you find that this is not happening, our ulama tell us, it goes back to jahal. Amir al Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Umma salli ala had wa ali Muhammad. He says, Man aqana. It says, "Annahu yufariku al-ahbab is one. If one is certain, yani yakin, aqana. If one is certain that they are going to leave those whom they love, wa yaskunu turab, and that they will be living in the dirt, wa yuajihu al-hisab, and that they will be undertaking accounting for their actions, wa yastaghni amma khalaf, and they will be needless of what they left behind, wa yaftaqiru ila ma qaddam, and they will be needy of what they are sending forward, kana hariyan bi qisar al-amal wa tool al-amal. He says if a person is, has yaqeen about these things, that hey, I'm going to leave everything behind, 
and I'm only going to need that which I'm sending forward. If a person has this level of yaqeen, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, he says then it will be befitting that person to lessen their expectations of this world and to increase their actions for the hereafter. Yeah? That means I don't need much in this world. Right? I'm going to go after that which is coming in the hereafter. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Uh, salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So that's the first reason our ulama give. And it's quite fascinating, right? That the way to cure that ignorance is to develop my certainty of the hereafter. There's nothing else that fixes it but that. Right? The more I have yaqeen about the hereafter, this is why even in the Quran, right? Whenever the whenever the Jannah is described or the hereafter is described, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wabil Akhiratihum Yuqinun. Right? Is when it comes for the belief in the Prophet They have Iman, they have faith in that which came to you and that which came before you. But when it comes to Akhira, وَبِلْ أَخِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ But when it comes to Akhira, they need to have Yaqeen. God wants us to almost have this certainty where I see Akhira. Right? Now how that's developed is practice, action, doing everything for that ultimate goal. And one day, inshallah, we will reach that ultimate goal where I am, everything I'm doing is preparing for that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And there are other characteristics of why we fall victim to tulul amal, false expectations. You know, and, and amazingly, our ulama tell us that some of these, mostly all of these, we've talked about previously. So, for example, uh, a reason why I fall prey to false expectations is because I am haris, I am covetous. Right? Covetous means that I am constantly desiring that which someone else has. So this is where I, I as an individual can't differentiate between want and need. Man, that's such an important characteristic to be able to do that. Yeah? Where what do I need and what do I want? If I am satisfied with what I am needy, what I need, I'm the wealthiest individual in the world because I don't desire then what I want or others have, right? When I, the way I desire what others, the, re, the reason why I crave what I want is because I see what others have and say, oh man, I don't have that. Right? So, and that naturally drives us towards chasing these things which take me away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, her being uh, covetous, being arrogant, having love of this world, uh, having lack of self-restraint, all of these things that we've spent weeks and weeks talking about prior to this are reasons why we fall prey towards false expectations. So, the reasons are many. And this, the fact that the reasons are many shows why or proves why so many people fall, fall prey to false expectations, right? In, in, any, in a variety of way, majority of the people are chasing something in this world which is taking them away from the ultimate goal of seeking God's pleasure, right? Um, and if we understand that, then I'm not saying you are falling prey to it, um, but it's important to ask certain questions, right? And these are like barometer checks. We have to ask ourselves these questions. So our ulama tell us, for example, ask yourself, am I planning for the day of judgment? <clears throat> am I seriously planning for the day of judgment? Right? Um, am I, for example, planning for my death? Right? I don't know, we don't like to think about that stuff, right? Like, uh, oh, why be so morbid? Right? Like imagine having a conversation with your wife or your spouse and saying, okay, in case I die, they'll freak out, right? They'd be like, don't talk about that. Like, why are you talking about that? But the reality is, what if, what if I die, right? Now, when we have that conversation, the, the outcome or the direction of that conversation can't just be material. So when I die, this is my bank password. Yeah, this is my this, this is the accounts, this is that. Well, that's, no, that's not the goal, right? When I die, okay, what am I sending forward? What am I, what, what are we sending forward if God forbid something happens? What are we going to get there when we um, cross over? Um, am I planning for my accounts that I have to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if I am, then I am not doing anything evil that I want to send forward. Um, am I constantly trying to improve myself or am I on cruise control? 
right? Um, am I, for example, am I affected by the admonishments that, I'm give, that I hear? So for example, you're sitting in this crowd right now, I'm giving these admonishments that come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt, and am I just be like, oh man, when is this guy going to finish? Right? Is, that, is that what's in my head? Like, oh my God, this guy is just dragging today. Right? And if that's what my, my, my thing is, man, be careful. Right? Because admonishments should have an effect. Right? Reality checks should have an effect. And if they're not having effect, it's, it's hinting at something. It's hinting that, oh my goodness, there is a destination I'm chasing that maybe is not what God wants me to chase. Right? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. And if we ask ourselves these questions, and by God, we're the best judge of this. right? If I ask myself these questions, and the answer to some of these are like, oh man, no, I'm not planning for my death. Right? Admonishments aren't really having that much of an impact on me. They're just bouncing off my shoulder and, and leaving. Right? Then that's an indication that there is a larger issue that I'm facing, right? And I'm telling you, I've, I've said this so many times and I say this, I remind myself of this all the time. I don't think God is concerned with the, the results, right? He can, I don't, in my heart of heart, I can't, I can't imagine God saying on the Day of Judgment, well, you didn't end up a muttaqi. Sorry, halas, finish. Well, you didn't end up a, mutawak a, a, a mutawakkil. You didn't end up a minas sabirin. No, God wants to see the struggle, right? God wants to see, am I trying to get there? Am I struggling to get there? Or am I just be like, oh, I'm cool where I am, right? And then we'll leave it up to God's mercy. The constant struggle has to be there. And if I find that, I, yes, I have something to work on, then we're on the right track. So how do we fix it? We've talked about how the trick happens. What are the causes of the tricks happening? Now, how do I fix it? And we're just going to touch upon it today and then continue that um, on Thursday, inshallah. The first step, right? I know there's like an overload of information, right? But it, it, the heart will accept it if the heart is open, right? Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first step is I have to admit there's a problem. Yeah? By God, this is like the most important step, yeah? You know, if I can't even admit that there's a problem, then either I'm really, really good, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with me, or there's another issue altogether where I can't see my own fault, right? Admission of problem, they say this, if you study counseling, or for example, if you've ever studied um, Narcotics Anonymous, or Alcoholics Anonymous, or Gamblings Anonymous, you know, they have all of these anonymous groups, right? If you have an issue, they have a circle of friends you can go to or a, circle, a group of people where things remain anonymous uh, and you discuss. And there's a 12-step program to healing yourself of your addiction. And the first step is admitting that you are an addict. Right? That means you can't even do step two unless you say that you have a problem. Right? This is where, like, you know, I use this example, but I use it lovingly. If you ever ask a smoker, Baba, are you addicted? I can give this up right now. Yeah? I can... I'm not finky though. Baba, yeah? You're an addict. It's okay to admit that you're an addict, right? There's nothing wrong, right? The first step to anything is admitting that there's an issue, right? Now, to be an addict of something, sometimes it's not bad, sometimes it's good, but it's, in the end of the day, there has to be an admission of our own fault. When you come from the perspective of spirituality, right? If I find that I am not receiving admonitions well, if I am struggling on these things, I have to first thing admit to a problem. Now, I don't admit to you. I'm not going to come and tell you, you know, Baba, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I admit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? God wants to see my, um, my neediness to Him. Right? That's all God wants to see. See, the, the, the more I continue to say, no, I'm not affected, no, I'm not affected, it's a saying that I don't need help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But when I say to God, you know, I'm struggling with this, Ya Allah, help me. That's when I admit that there's a problem and the faith and the glory of God will shower down upon us. Right? That's what He wants to see. He wants to see me become an abd. Not one who thinks that I am needy or needless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing is to admit there's a problem. The second point 
is that when I reflect on Tulul Amal, the what will help me seek a cure is to recognize the harm that is associated with having Tulul Amal. The harm that comes from having false expectations. And our ulama lists like uh, a dozen uh, things that are the byproduct of having false expectations. So one, for example, is I gain characteristics that are harmful right, to my own soul. So for example, I become a bully. Right? I become an oppressor. Um, I become dismissive of other people's feelings. Right? I become rude. I become arrogant. All of these things. Why? Because I, I only care about my own goals. Right? So it doesn't matter about you. Right? Uh, I'll treat you the way I want to treat you. I'll become this. I'll become that. Why? Because I want my goal. I don't care about your goal. So the first harmful effect that comes from it is that I gain characteristics that are harmful. The second effect that it has is that it hardens my heart. Right? So uh, the way to recognize that my heart is becoming hard um, is like some of the things that we've talked about. I'm not affected by admonishments, really. right? Like, um, and I'm not talking about crying for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You know? That's like a separate faucet altogether. You know, that faucet exists because of, of love and compassion and just the effect that the gham of Imam Abdullah alayhi salam has. So if I can, so you can't think to yourself or myself that, well, I cry for Ashura, so I'm not that hard-hearted. No, does Ashura then have an effect on my life? That's what the gauge is, right? Not the amount of tears I can shed in Muharram. What effect do those tears have on my life? Are, am I taking these admonishments? And if I'm not, then that's a product or a sign that my heart is hard. Um, I am not affected, for example, by the carnage I see around the world. So um, I cried for the Rohingyas three days ago. I felt bad for the Rohingyas two days ago. Now today it was just a scroll in my feed. I just went up. It didn't have an effect on me anymore. Right? That's an indication that you know this is something in my heart um, and that's a normal human product. Yeah? To be a believer I think in many, in many ways goes against human nature because human nature gets adapted. We have to be less adaptive and be constantly fluid. Right? So these are indications that my heart is becoming hard which is again a harm associated with it. Um, it makes me forget about the hereafter. Right? Um, I don't think about the, my death that often. I don't think about these things. This is another harmful effect of Tulul Amal. Um, and another effect would be, for example, I'm willing to humiliate myself or lower myself or abase myself um, to meet my goals. You know, that, okay, that's, that's the goal I've set. I want that promotion. So now I'm going to um, butter up my boss as much as I can. And I humiliate myself, for example, in that process of doing that ultimate goal, right? And you can translate that to a hundred different examples um, that come to your mind. All of these, right? And these are just some of what our ulama mentioned are the harmful effects associated with it. If I, am, if I understand that and if I truly believe that, it would help me recognize that there is a problem and that I have to fix this problem. And inshallah, we'll continue um, this discussion about other points of how to fix this problem. At the end of the day, there's no magic pill, you know. I can't be like, well, Ya Allah, I, through the course of my life, have developed a problem. Now take it away. No, it doesn't work like that, right? Like, as I developed it, I have to develop to take it away. But if, I, if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up doing something one day which will cost me my hereafter. Yeah? Something, some wrong turn along the way which will jeopardize my entire akhirah. And when we look at Karbala, that's what we see happen. Yeah? I guarantee you that when the people were signing up uh, or when the people were beginning to hear about uh, an uprising in Yazid wants an army, Ibn Ziyad wants an army, I'm pretty sure many of them did not start the day by saying, okay, I'm willing to give up my Jannah for this. Yeah? I don't think so. But as the time went on, and as they continue to march down that path of meeting that expectation of worldly gains, what they ended up sacrificing was their entire world and their hereafter. And this is what we have to be careful for. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
Tonight we are remembering two young boys who without a doubt were part of those who are shaheed or the part of the shuhada of Karbala. According to some narrations that Muslim bin Aqil came with his children to Kufa and when he was stranded and alone he tried to send his children off to send a message to Aba Abdullah. But these were young boys and it is said that they were captured and they were imprisoned for nearly a year in the dungeons of Kufa. I want us to imagine that. These two young boys, I swear everyone from the Ahlul Bayt suffered in the tragedy of Karbala. Huh? These two young boys remained in the prison until they decided to make their identity known to the guard of the prison. They saw a guard who they felt was compassionate, a guard who was merciful. So they say to him, Ya Shaykh, Hal ta'arifu Muhammad bin Abdullah? They say, Oh Shaykh, have you heard of Muhammad bin Abdullah? The man replies, Of course, he is the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could I not hear of him? He says, Ya Shaykh, Hal ta'arifu Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, Of course, I have heard of Ali. He was the cousin of Rasulullah. He says, Ya Shaykh, fa nahnu min itrati nabiyyik. He says, Oh Shaykh, we are from the family of your Prophet. Wa nahnu min wuldi Muslim bin Aqil. And we are from the family of Muslim bin Aqil. He just said the guard had pity on the children. He said, I am going to release you. And in the darkness of the night, he releases these children. But ah, where are these children to go? He just said every gully, every, every alley that the kids tried to go down. They saw that there were army people blocking off the streets. The children ended up by the river Euphrates and sat by a tree. It is said there this lady came to fetch some water and heard the sounds of two children. She looks at the two children and she says, you should not be here. There is a curfew in place in this city. The children must have cried and said, Oh lady, you look like a good lady. You look like a pious lady, but we have nowhere to go. <laughs> Again, the conversation must have ensued. Tell us where you are from. They said, we are from Medina. Ah, Medina Tul Munawwara. When the lady heard that name, she must have said, from where? Which family? Until that identity was known, then she invited invited them to her house, but she warned them and said, Oh children, know that my husband Harith the Mal'oon works for Ibn Ziyad. So you must be very careful. It is reported the children spent in a small room in the night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they both fell asleep until they both awoke crying. Muhammad looks at Ibrahim. He says, Oh my brother, I saw our father in a dream and our father is calling for us Ibrahim replies back oh my brother Muhammad I too saw our father and he is calling us towards him <coughs> the cries of the children awoke this Mal'oon he grabs the children and ties them around a pole when the sun rises he takes them by the river Euphrates he pulls out his sword but first he asks his servant who is there I want you to slaughter these boys Ah, I swear, my brothers and sisters, the servant replies back and he says that I cannot kill these two young boys. I wonder, I swear, I ask myself that what happened to the hearts of those in Karbala? What happened to the heart of Hurmala that he would strike an arrow on Ali Yunila? What happened to the one who slapped the face of Sakina? Where was the compassion? It is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed his mercy from those in Karbala. The servant replies, I will not kill this boy. And then he told his son, I want you to kill these boys. The son replied to, I will not kill these young boys. Until the man came forward himself, the children reply back, O oh, Sheikh. Why don't you instead sell us in the markets? You will get money for us. Then he refused. He says, Oh Sheikh, send us to Ibn Ziyad. Let him deal with it herself. He said, No as well. Finally, the children asked, Give us now. 
an opportunity to recite one final salah. The children in that moment remember their duty to Allah. It is said they recited their salah. Then they raised their hands to the sky and said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Oh Allah, we are coming to you. What we ask is that you give our mother sabr when she hears the news of our